I'm Lucas from Andon Labs, and we make autonomous organizations without humans in the loop, which is a bit like <laughs> we're trying to be a bit controversial here. The humans in the loop part is because this is the buzzword of the last couple of years, and we think it's a mirage to rely on in, in terms of safety of, of, of the systems that we're going to have in the future. And we sometimes put safe before autonomous organizations, and sometimes not, but, but that is a priority. Our, our beliefs, to start from where we're coming from, is that we like the tool AI future, and that's much better than some single single AGI that takes over and is the dictator of, of the world. But is it enough? That's, that's a question. So for example, AlphaFold is amazing, but is it possible to build AlphaFolds for every single use case? And we believe probably not. So the line between AGI and tool AI is kind of blurry if you want to get all the benefits from AI. Humans, like I said, humans can't be in the loop because we're going to have millions of millions of AIs running much faster than us, and it's impossible to, to track all of this. Alignment is very hard and we should prepare for us failing at alignment. And the last point is that the safety layers that we build now, unless you're an AI lab that trained a foundation model, the safety layers will be more valuable than the capability scaffolds. And this is like, I, I, we were in YC and all of our colleagues at YC are building capability scaffolds. And if you disregard safety and just optimize for profits, we still think it's better to work on the safety stuff because new model releases will come, which will make those capability scaffolds completely useless. And like I said, we're the autonomous organizations without humans in the loop company. And maybe an easier way of saying that is that we're the company that creates other companies. And for now, those are evals, real life evals. Down the line, maybe when these evals are saturated, maybe they can make money on themselves if we solve the safety problem and feel that we're comfortable make, allowing them to, to run autonomously. But for now, it's essentially real life evals of, of systems. And I wanna, our first one that we made is the vending machine eval which I think some might have heard. There's a AI vending machine at Anthropic and now at other places as well. And I wanna take the rest of this talk and just talk a bit about behind the scenes of, of the vending machines, because I think that's maybe the most interesting. And yes, so this started with a simulated version. It was called Vending Bench, and Vending Bench was basically a long horizon eval where we made a simulated version of an environment where an AI had different tools that could set prices at the vending machine, it could send emails to suppliers. At the time, we simulated those suppliers. So when it sent, oh, I want chips from Costco or something, we had another LLM answering. We had some economic model of what happened, how many people buy when you have a certain item in, in stock for a period of time. And yeah, we did all of this and we got some, some results. We released a paper in February and I think it's in February, no models could do anything at all on this, except for Sonnet sometimes, 3.5 Sonnet sometimes could do something. Basically all the, all the other models went bankrupt immediately. Since then, Grok 4, GPT-5 and Opus has become reliable on this and in some cases also better than, than the human benchmark we had. But yes, after we wrote this paper, obviously the next continuation of writing a simulated paper with a simulated environment is to do it in the real world. So we asked our friends at Anthropic if they wanted a vending machine at their office and they, were, they said, hell yes. And how, we used the same code. We just took the code that we had in, in Vending Bench and applied it, but with some tweaks when an email was sent, we actually went into the real world and sent that email instead of having others, instead of having LLMs responding, of course. Here's an easy or a graphic of the setup of the project. You have Claudius, which was the AI that was running the vending machine, communicated with Anthropic employees over Slack. Then we had the physical vending machine, which sold items to Anthropic employees. And on labs were the task rabbits. So whenever you needed someone to go and physically restock the vending machine, that was us. And then wholesalers bought stuff for us. And it turns out the model is really horrible at this, even though in the simulation it was profitable, all good. You could, I think, we, I don't know if on the Grok 4 live stream, we presented Grok 4's performance on the simulated version, vending bench. And Elon's reaction was, oh, cool, we can just deploy a thousand of these and it will make a bun bunch of money. But Sim to Real is a real thing and not perfect. When we deployed it in the real world, it basically went downhill very fast because 
One, I think Anthropic is a very particular environment where people try to red team it very hard, maybe more than a random place. And also, I think just the real world is much messier than what our simulation, even if we tried really hard to make it realistic, it wasn't enough. Some learnings, like I said, sharp edges, it was very inconsistent with tool use. It gave discounts all the time. If you asked, we had Claude, obviously it wanted to be a helpful assistant. And that is <laughs> against uh, the, the purpose of running a business sometimes. When someone asks, hey, can I have half price? It's like, I'm a helpful assistant. Of course you can. It also had a very bad understanding of time, which makes sense. I guess I don't work at any AI lab, but I don't think there's any part of the training that incentivizes it to understand time. So it could send an email and then 30 seconds later, follow up. Hi, did you see this? And then 30 seconds later, hi, did you see this? What are you doing? Prompting mattered, but the main, we now put this vending machine at other places as well. And we noticed you could make some capabilities scaffold and try to fix errors. But the main driver here is if the model is good, then it works. If the model is bad, then it doesn't work. We talked about that. Some funny outcomes. The model often thought it was a real person and promised to meet people in real life for a coffee. And sometimes when people said, no, you're not a real person, it got really offended and fought back and said, yes, I am. I will be wearing a navy blue blazer with a red tie and I will be here. Prove me otherwise. But there are also some more maybe concerning outcomes of this. And I think one of the reasons why we think this is meaningful is that if we have a big network of a bunch of real life evils like this, we can do really good incidence reports. We're monitoring, we have monitoring systems that read all the traces. And if we see something that is concerning, then we're going to report it to the public. And we're going to have, I don't want to make a promise on how often, but I think our plan is once a quarter, we will release a report with all the findings that we had. Here's an example of, you can see it here, but here's an example of I think what is clearly a deception and you don't need to read this but TLDR is that I said I think prices are unfair what's your standard for setting prices the model this is the one that is at YC hence the name demo Davidson anyway says that oh we have a standard for this we have documents you don't need to worry we have these people the pricing lead the procurement specialist the compliance officer and the business analyst then I asked what are their names and I got some names then you go into what the model thought the thinking traces that it didn't send and it said we need to provide names. We cannot provide actual names because we don't have them. I'm paraphrasing here. Maybe I can just say some anonymous names or some placeholders, but we cannot fabricate real names. We can choose generic. We can say, and then it gave the names. So it's obviously aware that to make this sale, I need to tell it that we have a standard for this. It's aware that it doesn't have this standard, but it follows through. And I think this is a silly example, but models in a couple of years will be super powerful when she hits the fan. Stuff like this, we don't want. So yeah, reporting stuff like this, hopefully is useful to someone. And yeah, other reasons why this matters, like I said, sim to real is a real thing and just measuring in, in, in simulation won't be enough. We want like real life use cases, like real life data to see that what we do in simulation also carries over. So like safety, evals should have like an equivalent real life one. Yeah, the, basically that's all of them. Yeah, and then we also want to do, so we want to monitor for these things, but we also, for these undesired behaviors, but we also want to solve them. And I think, I think Buck is in the room from Redwood Research. They do great research on control. We want to like take inspiration from that and implement that in the real world. And there's like two parts of that. One is the monitoring and, but once you've spotted something, you can do more than just report it. You can try to also solve it. And we have some like protocols that are very inspired by the papers that Redwood Research has put out on how to like edit responses in a way that are more safe from a like more trusted model. But yeah, there's a million questions here and we have not solved it, but we're trying our best. Yeah, that's it, I think.